Welcome back to another free-falling episode of Fearless TV, the program that is all styles and no style. Coming up in the next half hour of brain bouncing action, we're back on board with our resident stuntman Anthony as he attempts to come to grips with 500 cc's of no brake solo speedway machinery. And we'll head to a seriously remote location for some breathtaking abseiling into a spectacular gorge high in the New Zealand Alps. All this and other bits of stuff for Fearless TV. <laughs> Yep, we're back on the track. Just in case you missed any of the previous action, our intrepid stuntman had volunteered to attempt to learn to ride a 500cc solo speedway bike. And while it's true, he has had past riding experience, otherwise this would be pure insanity at this stage, he's only spent about 10 minutes in total on board a machine with no brakes or gears. And after a few initial attempts and many briefings from our pro riders, progress is still slow. Do you want a foot? Needless to say, this bike presents a completely different problem when compared to your everyday relatively quick off the mark street bike, which is generally best ridden without the rear wheel braking traction in all the corners, although it does happen from time to time. And depending on the rider's skill, he's usually able to get out of a huge tank slapper or being high sided. This particular beast, with its extra low centre of gravity, high gearing and huge torque, requires extra skillful throttle control. Firstly to crack the throttle to brake traction, and then to slide the bike through the corners. In fact, the slowest way to lap the track is with the throttle wide open and drifting the bike sideways. Second shot, so feeling a bit better, feeling like I'm getting a bit more speed up, which has uh, helped me go in and come into the corner. And then because you come in faster, you get you're already going faster, you don't have to pull the throttle on that much. Yeah. The trick is to back off in the straights and roll on into the corners. Not as easy as it sounds when you remember this bike has no brakes or gears. And the only way to stop the engine is by stalling or separation from the bike, causing the wrist attached to the kill switch to cut the engine. Here's one of our junior riders demonstrating how the action should work. We'll catch up with Stuntman Anthony in the coming episodes to see if he masters this fine art. The sport of mountain biking has developed to the point where almost any natural terrain has become accessible on human-powered two-wheeled high-tech machinery. While off-road riding on forest trails is still by far the most popular area for most mountain bike enthusiasts, recent developments in suspension and frame technology, thanks to the involvement of well-established motocross equipment manufacturers, has meant the most rugged terrain can now be covered. This has also reduced the learning curve for novice riders, as the bikes have far improved handling and durability, enabling riders to put in much more practice time with less maintenance, and progressing to a higher skill level more rapidly.
specialised trick cycles are also now being developed, much like the motorcycle trials bikes, and events showcasing balance and technical manoeuvrability over and around obstacles are becoming increasingly popular. Downhill events are staged around the world, attracting ever-increasing numbers of spectators, with courses borrowing heavily from the world of motocross on a smaller scale to allow for human-powered machinery. Mountain biking has the added attraction of being more in tune with nature and self-propelled. And let's face it, there's nothing quite like blasting down the side of a mountain inches from the rocks. Welcome back to our final test on the ascent to the very top of the world. We're at the highest base camp on Everest and preparations are underway in the pre-dawn darkness to tackle the most physically demanding section of the climb. To reach the summit and descend while light is still available, climbers must leave base camp well before the dawn sun has even contemplated rising. The preferred route along the South Col into the jet stream and onto the summit must be completed around midday. Otherwise, the risk of descending in darkness is far too great and death almost a certainty. After a fitful night's rest, many climbers have arrived at the summit in dusk and paid the penalty with their lives. On this final exposed ridge, the sheer enormity of the climber's accomplishment becomes obvious, and the vast panoramic vistas either side, with the Himalayas stretching as far as the eye can see, also serves as a reminder of how little room for error there is at this altitude. Lack of oxygen once again makes each step last minutes, and at 8,000 plus metres, you can be sure the air is getting very thin. Each piece of equipment and supplies now seems to have increased in weight and there's a sense of carrying your very life on your back. The scenery from the highest rock in the world is incredible and it's hard to imagine standing on an eight kilometre high landmark an experience that is sure to last a lifetime. With only 20 metres to the summit, the feeling of exhaustion gives way to elation.
Then it's on to the top to breathe the pure thin air and rejoice before descending down. Abseiling has remained the quiet achiever of extreme sports for a number of reasons. The most obvious being a relatively large degree of fitness is required to climb to a height where the journey down becomes an added challenge. Something that is not an attractive proposition for most people. People who take part in multi-sports events, however, are not like most people, so a longish hike to the overhang of a remote cliff represents a challenge to be enjoyed. And when it happens to be in the Alps, surrounded by fantastic scenery, who would be complaining? The sheer drop into the valley below is motivation enough to make sure extreme caution is exercised in both the planning and execution of this climb, be it up or down.
This guy is keeping the traditions of solo speedway alive and at 13 years old has already mastered the fine art of steering with the back wheel. And that's why he deserves our Fearless TV Play of the Day. This is what happens when you suddenly realise you have too much speed, not enough track left and no brakes whatsoever. Time to carve up a few more tubes now. We're back in the Pacific Ocean for some of the cleanest, consistent tubes that we've witnessed in a long time. Water's clean, water temperature's good, and the perfectly formed barrels just keep rolling in. Half a dozen tube rides later with some nice cutbacks and floaters thrown in and the biggest worry now is running out of energy paddling out for one more perfect set. Surfing big waves in shallow water above a jagged reef, or even monster ocean breaks like Mavericks and Jaws is one thing, but throwing yourself into a rock-strewn Grade 6 River Rapid is a whole new category of a few sandwiches short of a picnic. Speed check with the stick first. Then it's a bit of visualisation technique.
The only saving grace about river surfing is it serves as a perfect opportunity for bodyboard manufacturers to test the buoyance of their boards using human guinea pigs. This kind of action can only be compared to going over Niagara Falls holding onto a rubber ducky. It's unclear how river surfing actually came about, but its origins can be roughly traced to when some unlucky raft passenger first fell overboard, and the river guides watched on an amusement and thought, hell, he's still afloat. This could be a new sport we're seeing. Unfortunately, the true river surfer was never given credit or even seen again. Nowadays, the skill in river surfing lies primarily in the ability to hold your breath and keep your senses together while being pounded and forced along by thousands of litres of rapidly moving water, while at the same time avoiding water obstacles such as rocks, trees, whirlpools, driftwood and the occasional car body. In short, we'll have to wait a few years for this to become an Olympic sport.